Let us pray. May your ancient word come alive in this moment. And may we be moved to know we are enough and enough is enough. May the words of my mouth and meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about you, but for me this past week was a scary week, uh, whether it was seeing pictures uh, of the devastation of raging fire in Hawaii, or watching the news of 20,000 people leaving Yellowknife down one highway or through the air to flee their city and leave behind their homes, or whether it was watching the newspaper pictures of places like Kelowna that are burning and people leaving, or hearing about a hurricane in Mexico, or people in California at the United Methodist Congregation, which uh, I've got a connection with there. They are not worshiping today. They're telling people to stay home due to the floods that they're expecting there. Or whether it's reading the news and being told that this is the warmest the planet has ever been, or hearing that records have been set for Florida waters at 38 degrees Celsius, the ocean water, no wonder when you see the Globe and Mail and you have one word, inferno, this is the news that we all are fully aware of. Our world is on fire and in big trouble and the planet is burning. I'll return to that in a moment. On Thursday evening, I went to a movie that I will say Oppenheimer. I hope I'm saying that correct. A person I never heard of till this summer. Sadly, just showing my ignorance. Oppenheimer uh, and the story of the building of the atomic bomb. Yes, I know a lot of people are talking about Barbie too. That might, <laughs> that might be next week. I'm going to go with my daughter this week. But the movie about Robin Oppenheimer is one of the lead scientists of the making of the atomic bomb. And this story, this factual story written in the 19, takes place in the 40s is both action story and parable. And I want to show you a quick trailer of about this movie. So we'll cross fingers. We imagine a future. And our imaginings horrify us. They won't fear it until they understand it. And they won't understand it until they've used it. Theory will take you only so far. With such a weapon. But we have no choice. seen this movie in our midst a few. Okay. I can re recommend it and the three hours flies by like that. Oppenheimer is charged with the task to lead the Manhattan Project and he calls the project himself because of the three locations, the Trinity Project. I love how that is linked to our understanding of Trinity. But the goal is to make uh, the bomb to drop on the Nazis in World War II. And he's very brilliant, gifted scientist who's got his head down and all of his tension is to the making of the bomb. And he persists and he succeeds in building the bomb. 
but he fails to understand what really will happen when it is unleashed and the success that everybody claims is actually his own personal failure. He, he fails to comprehend that there are consequences to the actions that he's taken. Oppenheimer experiences a moral crisis and in every way trying to not have the bomb finally used. He argues that this is not necessary, but indeed he was overtaken and indeed the bomb was dropped, as you know, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki and some 210,000 people were hurt and maimed and killed as a result. At the peak of all of this, Oppenheimer reads, at the, quoting a scripture of the Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, now I become death, destroyer of the worlds. Now I become death, the destroyer of the worlds. At another point, as he wrestles with what has happened and what is going on after he has seen the brilliance of the sun and he sees its power, he says, Prometheus stole the sun from the gods and gave it to humans. For, he, for this, he was chained to a rock and tortured for eternity. Tortured for eternity seems to be what you see in Oppenheimer's own life. He is tortured and riddled with guilt and he's baffled by the short-sightedness of those in power and he's tentative with his renowned success and what the damage the bomb can do. It's amazing to watch him in this scenario and see how he moves from the brilliance of his science to the results of what is taking place on the world. The sub-story is the jealousy of fellow scientist, Professor Strauss, who for his own political gain is determined to ruin Oppenheimer's reputation and his attempt to link Oppenheimer to the Communist Party. You see politics and backroom politics where power at all costs is the attempt. And you see the results in this terrifying picture of a trial that is rigged. Throughout the movie, the subtext of this is also his own personal life and his personal struggle. And as he wrestles with infidelity, his wife knows that he has had a mistress and when the mistress dies and Oppenheimer is deeply troubled, she does not console him, but she stabs him with this quote, you don't get to commit a sin and then ask all of us to feel sorry for you when there are no consequences, when there are consequences. What she's saying to him is, your actions lead to consequences. And it seems so often in our religious life, we don't really want to face the consequences about how we live. And the great sum of this movie for me is a connection for us to wake up and know that there are consequences for how we live. There are consequences for what we build. There are consequences for who we vote for. There are consequences for how we spend our money in government. The movie is filled with incredible proverbs that stick as Oppenheimer lives in his own existential hell. And they shift the attention not just from a new bomb, but to a new era in time. A new era in time we're all familiar with as people wrestle with the atomic bomb and nuclear weapons. Toward the end of the movie, in what would be a high point to meet the president, he confesses to the President Truman that he feels like he has blood on his hands the president says it was my decision and then sends him away calling Oppenheimer a crybaby. Here's a 50 second, 50 second video I want to show you of Oppenheimer reflecting back on what he has done. This is in the 50s. The world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. What's so beautiful in this movie is to hear the pace at which he speaks and the way in which they speak. 
it got me lost down in the dungeon of listening to him speak, and I went on a YouTube piece and listened to a speech that he gave at Princeton. And so amazing that at this time in the Princeton 1950s, the lecture, the public lecture, and I was thinking about how I'm craving public lectures to sit and listen to others speak their wisdom and truth. But the lecture begins with uh, President Mackay, the principal of Pr Princeton Theological Seminary, offering the most beautiful prayer and then the most beautiful introduction to this scientist as he then steps in, just as he did, in a very reflectful, thoughtful understanding of all that has taken place because of the science he used and the consequences that are unleashed on the world. For me, this connection of Bible and newspaper is all about the task you have, and me too, to connect the two, the Bible and the newspaper, and the stories of the inferno and the stories of our scripture. When I walked out of the movie on Thursday night, I don't know if you remember, but the smoke was ominous. You could see it, and I literally felt like I was at the end of the world. I'd seen this movie, you're zoned in for three hours, you step out, and here you are, shrouded in smoke. And then, reading the newspaper yesterday, The Inferno, talking about our planet right now. So what's the connection? What are the connections for me and for you? My daughter, Allie, who's 26, has a boyfriend named Jack, and he's seen the movie twice. And I said to Jack, tell me what you think. And he wrote these words in a text that I want to share with you. Now, I do got to tell you, I asked him to be here. but He's 26. He's sleeping. He'll watch this later. I know you will, Jack. <laughs> Here's what he wrote. 26-year-old. I think the story and theme of Oppenheimer is equally relevant today as it was in the 40s. What, we, what are the unknown consequences of people creating something, following a passion, voicing an idea, whatever it is, and how do you deal with those consequences once it's out of your control? Just as a nuclear bomb became power that Oppenheimer could no longer control, we see that same result with things created today. What are the consequences of a technology like Facebook or Instagram on the world now? I would add AI. What are the consequences of the iPhone being created and its uncontrollable effects on younger generations? What is the chain reaction that Oppenheimer cites of a Trump ideology now out in the world? The nuclear bomb has made the goal of purposely beating the Nazis. Facebook was made to connect people around the world. Regardless of the intention of something, it is unpredictable consequences that we need to be conscious of. Leaders, founders, politicians, managers, everyone, whoever it is, has the important role when it comes to utilizing power or responsibility to think of the consequences. Products are powerful, thoughts and ideas are powerful, nuclear bombs are powerful, and it's up to those leaders and everyone around them to use and to minimize those negative consequences. For me, this movie is about the consequences of our actions. And this may, may seem really heavy and not much fun on a Sunday morning, but I believe that's where we've got to go in our faith. We do need to recognize and look into what the effects of climate change we create are and what are the consequences of how we will live our life. There will be a day when we won't walk out of a theater. There will be a day when this issue is the only issue. It is the only issue we have right now that we all participate in, what are the consequences of our behavior? And like Oppenheimer, who was head down and focused on making a bomb, we are continuing our life, heads down, eyes covered, pretending it will go away, ignoring the inevitable consequences of our life actions. The bomb of environmental destruction is inevitable, as we're seeing today. We, too, are not seeing the bigger interconnectedness of this action. We're so focused on the task of living the way we live, we've forgotten the larger picture of how living is killing the planet, and it's on fire. And so, how, what may you may ask, how, when you take the Bible and newspaper? This past week, Gary Mason, who's a reporter for the Globe and Mail, writes about how Alberta, I'm a proud Albertan, Alberta is missing the boat on the global pursuit of renewable energy. 
I know I should have said it last week, but I forgot. Thank God I got two weeks to do this. But countries around the world are investing incredible resources, trillions of dollars in renewable energy, and Alberta is pausing right now. Even Tulsa, Oklahoma, cap oil capital of the world, is being called a green hub. Last week, our province put a freeze on renewable developments. Here's where business and environment go hand in hand for the betterment of both, and yet we are shutting down the province on renewable energy, and we are now the laughing stock of the world. And so people wondered, why? Is it because we are trying to appease the rural area of our province? Is it because Ottawa is a big bad guy? Perhaps it is more to the fact that the Premier is being advised when someone says in their office that solar energy is but ugly and a scam. I say but ugly is better than dead ugly. We are on a pace to be a global leader. I want to be proud of Alberta to be at the undisputed epicenter of renewable energy, and instead we are right now the folly of the world. In the end, we're like a dinosaur. Worse, we have our head stuck in ash. He ends his piece, hopefully common sense will prevail, or the good people of Alberta will say enough and urge their government to rejoin the 21st century. Climate is the only issue that connects us across all political parties, no matter who you are. In this sanctuary last fall, I saw a lecture here by a professor at the university who came in saying, I'm here as a scientist and I'm here as a grandfather. I'm here to report that everyone, every party, the environmentalists through to the right-wing extremists, all of us are at fault. And he said, the only hope is in us, the citizens. And it's only with all of us say enough the change will come. And he stood here and he said, I have no hope that's going to happen. And it was a stingingly brilliant wake up for me. And so it's not about political parties, it's about all of us saying, this is our planet and this is what we want, but will we stand up, will we speak out and say enough? So you're saying, I didn't come to a political rally, John. How does this connect to my theology? I want to say, what does the connection to God have to do with how you live? What is it what we say and sing, and how does it take legs in your body? How do we take what we say and sing and live it out in the world? Religion isn't about an hour or an hour and a half if you're unlucky on a Sunday morning. It is a 24-7 process. And so what do we do? And here's where you're not going to like me at all. We do theology. First, we begin with confession. I know we all want to come here and not drag down. I'm not dragging you down. I'm saying we come to speak truth and hear truth. And when we hear truth and know truth and speak truth, you are touching God. And so it begins with confession. I love the word. You know what the word means? With voice. That's what it means. To voice. To acknowledge that we all miss the mark. Like I spoke a few weeks ago, everyone misses the mark. And I love this definition. We refuse to learn. Sin is refusing to learn to say, I know it all. Here's the answer. Instead of the humility to say, just like Oppenheimer, I don't understand it. I don't know is sin. So first we name our sin and acknowledge the consequences. And when we acknowledge our consequences and not wallow in it and beat each other up in guilt and shame, but rather name truthfully and honestly, we are energized to then repent, which means to turn around and go in a new direction. You see, confession, naming sin, repenting is life-giving and freeing. And you let go of the guilt and shame and begin to move in a new way. It frees us not to react, but to act. It frees us from our guilt and our human frailty to say, this is who I am, this is what I've done, but now I'm going this way. So it isn't about a political party, it's all of us, regardless of political party. It's about the human party. 
That's why we walk in a pride parade. That's why we walk in a missing and murder women's uh, parade. That's why we will walk and say somewhere, somehow, to someone, enough. We need to turn in a new direction. Oppenheimer was an incredibly, move, incredibly moving movie for me. And in it, he speaks, I believe, of the grace of owning our sin, of owning who we are and turning in a new way to say that it will only be when we name our sin and seek a better way for all of us and say enough is enough when we take the proverbs of wisdom and live them in our life that we will know and indeed the joy and grace of being a repentant sinner. And it's in owning that and knowing it that you will walk and run in this world and God damn it, we will change this world. Thanks be to God.